start chatting. All right, quick reminder what we talked about yesterday. So we figured out a few things about metabolism. That metabolism, in fact, is um, all chemical reactions in the cell, right? Catabolism, reactions of degradation. Anabolism, reactions of synthesis. To give you kind of a heads up, in many cases, in I would say 99% cases, degradation in the cell, you know, breakdown of fats, breakdown of proteins, breakdown of sugars. When we talk about big molecules, how do we call generally, what, what is required, what do we need to quote unquote add to the molecule of a protein, or molecule of a carbo polysaccharide to break it down? Water. So it's those are reactions of hydrolysis, right? When we get to the elementary building blocks like fatty acids or monosaccharides or amino acids, it's going to be different. Those catabolic reactions are different. And those catabolic reactions, they involve the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another, right? How do we call the reactions? that involve electron transfer, redox. So oxidation, when something is oxidized, when the molecule is oxidized, what happens to its electron or electrons? It, it, say again, it gives it away. It loses electrons, gives it away to some other molecule. Okay, and the molecule that accepts the electrons, it is what? Re reduced okay be familiar with that with, the, with that terminology and we started to talk about ATP right and I, I told you that we're going to discuss why ATP is the energy currency of the cell I usually use the analogy of money why do we need money I mean on the large economic scale why do we use money in the first place? Why are you getting paid in those paper bills, not in bread or pork, I don't know, whatever? Believe me, well, if we, we're, not, we're in the United States, not in Saudi Arabia, so pork would be universally accepted too, except for vegans. But other than that, Pork's fine, beef's fine, right? Seriously, why do we need money? Let's say you're a farmer, okay, and I'm a, a, a baker. You give me a pig, okay, slaughtered pig, and I give you, and I, I'm telling you for a month I'm going to supply you with bread. Is that going to work? Fine. We don't need money for that. We technically don't need money for the economy to run. Oh, there's a little critter right there. That's a centipede. Let it go. Um, okay, now think about this. You can, you, can, you can easily think about, you know, like food exchange, right? Clothing and food exchange. What about services like teaching? Services like, I don't know, babysitting? Services like protection. It's really hard to, essentially, if you if you try to impose a natural exchange, it you're gonna everything becomes a currency. Pork is a currency, beef is a currency, bread is a currency. Everything is a currency, right? And you have so many currencies and that exchange rates. Exactly. So you have certain standard. And you can value different things in that standard. Think about the cell. What serves as the energy source? That's not energy currency, energy source in the cell. What can serve as a source of energy in the cell? Light, something else. Hmm? Look, chemicals, which chemicals? Sugars, great, something else. Lipids, proteins, right? Many things. Now imagine you have a certain reaction, say protein synthesis. So you need to 
put amino acids together, it's reaction, this reaction, is it anabolic or catabolic? When you put things together, when you synthesize, anabolic. So it, usually anabolic reactions require energy, right? So you need to run protein synthesis and you need to get energy from somewhere. Say today you have abundant supply of sugars. So you got to have a certain enzymatic system, certain biochemical system to extract that energy from sugars and plug it in and channel it into the protein synthesis. Does that make sense? Tomorrow you run out of sugars, but you have really good supply of lipids. So now you've got to have another system that will extract that energy from lipids and channel it directly into the protein synthesis. So you end up with a number of hypothetical enzymatic systems that will take energy from certain supply and channel it to a particular reaction. And you got to have that specific system for every anabolic process in the cell. And it becomes, it just hypothetically would be such a hassle because of those connections that you have to make, because of the goddamn chemistry. Instead, what cells do, they take any energy sources, any nutrients, right? Chemical nutrients. Or they have energy source like light, okay, and they eventually convert this energy in ATP. And then you have universal systems in every chemical, in every anabolic process in the cell, ATPases or GTPases, okay, whatever, that break down ATP, releasing energy that will feed reactions. Does that make sense? So energy from the nutrients is used to produce ATP, okay, and ATP is merely a storage of energy in this gamma and beta phosphate bonds. When they're broken down in gamma bond, this one is the, it stores the most, the, the highest amount of energy, okay. So that when, when this bond is, is broken, energy that's released can be used for the reactions in the cell. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions? Before we move on, just to remind you, electrons do not travel in the cell by themselves. They carry it by electron carriers. Why I stress it so much? Because when we're going to discuss process of the cell respiration, we will focus on the carriers quite a lot. Reactions that produce energy, that release energy, called exergonic. Breakdown of ATP is exergonic reaction, right? Does that make sense? Because it, it releases energy and it also a catabolic reaction. Most of the catabolic reactions release energy, produce energy. Okay. Um, reactions of synthesis, anabolic reactions, are mostly endergonic. So they require energy. Does that make sense? Now, you have to appreciate, though, that Okay, let's say you have a reaction, a catabolic reaction like this, that produces a certain amount of energy, one. Right? And then you have anabolic reaction that uses energy E2. If this reaction the upper one, the catabolic, provides energy for the lower one. E1 and E2, are they going to be equal or one of them is going to be greater? Energies. Energy that is released in a catabolic reaction. And energy that is used in sort of adjacent anabolic reaction. 
Are they going to be equal or one of them is going to be greater? Equal. I think so. When you, you have a fuel gas tank in your car, right? You put gas in it. Gas stores chemical energy, right? What, your car, what does it use this chemical energy for? Huh? Okay, combustion and then, and then you go forward. Okay, moving wheels, okay? This all energy that is in the gas, is all energy that's in the gas is used for rolling wheels. No. Big chunk, where does it go? In which form? We'll lose it. In which form? What happens to your engine when it works? Can you touch it? Yeah. So we lose it as a heat, right? Actually, the efficiency, think about this, use chemical energy of the gas to produce mechanical work, wheels rolling, right? Only best engines, the, the very, like the fantastic combustion engine, it's about 35% of energy in the gas is actually used to rotate the wheels. Everything else goes in the heat. Same in a, in a Alive organisms. E1 is going to be greater than E2. The difference between those is going to be lost as the heat. Does that make sense? All organisms produce heat. That's inevitable. Okay? Does that make sense? So not, not a single system, a live system, is 100% effective. Okay? The energy that's produced is the result of exergonic reaction, okay, is going to be greater than the energy used in endergonic, and the difference will be released as the heat. Now, the great example of anabolic reaction being endergonic is ATP synthesis and um, hydrolysis of ATP highlighted in red here, okay, is the exergonic catabolic reaction. And if you look at this, look at this flow chart, or well, flow chart scheme, whatever you want to call it, okay, energy that is released during the ATP hydrolysis can be used, for example, to synthesize polysaccharides. That's what we do when we produce glycogen, for example, we use ATP energy to energy in ATP to produce glycogen. Okay. On the other hand, breakdown of glucose in the processes of aerobic respiration, processes of glycolysis, and if it's if it's fermentation glycolysis, that's it. If it's aerobic respiration, then prep cycle, and finally electron transport chain. Um, it is used for ATP synthesis. Okay, does that make sense? So you have to, you have to understand, you know, the idea of energy flow, exergonic versus endergonic, anabolic versus catabolic. Now, all those chemical reactions in the cell are facilitated by enzymes. Practically all enzymes in a cell are what type of biological macromolecule? Proteins, yes. There are some RNA molecules called ribosomes. We learned about one such ribosome being a part of the ribosome. Um, this ribosome actually transfers the growing polypeptide chain to the new amino acid, so-called peptidyl transferase. Uh, and for me, one of the 
interesting things in science is that sometimes you see the great discovery as it unveils during your lifetime. I was 11 and I found the just started to get into the science and I started to uh, read like old magazines, popular magazines, and there was an article about the guy who now is in University of Colorado Boulder, Thomas Czech. In 1984, I think, he published the first paper showing that RNA can actually serve as an enzyme. And for me at the time, it was shocking. Because in a good way, your knowledge, your concepts being shattered completely. We were taught strictly all enzymes are proteins. And then, you know, in your lifetime, the guy discovers that, no, nah, that's not true. Not all of them are proteins, not really. RNA can work as an enzyme too. That was pretty cool. And he actually published the paper in 84 and got Nobel Prize something like 91 or something, which by the measures of Nobel Prize Committee is extremely fast. Some people had to wait for like 40 years to get the Nobel Prize. This guy got it like this. Okay. So enzymes are catalysts, right? So they facilitate the reactions. Okay. What does that mean? Can you find, uh, can you give me a synonym to the word facilitate? Simpler synonym. How, what is, what is, what, what, what it is to facilitate something? Yeah, speed things up. To, to help something, to make something happen. Okay? That would otherwise happen extremely slow. Okay? Like chemical reactions in the cell. If you would take two molecules, or I don't know, if you take glucose, make a water solution of glucose, what are the chances that you're going to end up with a glycogen? Pretty low, okay? If you take, I don't know, uh, lactose, milk sugar, dilute it in water, how long would you have to wait? to actually get galactose and glucose in the solution instead of the, the disaccharide. You would have to wait, I would bet, years. Maybe more than years, like tens, hundreds of years. So these reactions that we, we are used to them, we know that they happen in the snap of a finger, they, without enzymes, they would be terribly slow. We wouldn't be able to sustain the living. Okay? So how does the reaction happen? The substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme. Okay, you can see this bound. And both so active site adjusts its shape a little. Okay? Changes a little changes conformation. And then amino acids, let's talk about proteins, amino acids in the uh, active site, they change the energy, they weaken the chemical bonds in the substrate, okay? So that substrate can be converted into products. Does that make sense? Substrate, usually it is uh, written as S, is converted into products and enzyme facilitates the reaction. Of course, this scheme, question, this scheme that you see, it shows you the reaction when something is broken down, right? It doesn't have to be so. You know, there are enzymes that put things together, as we saw the replication of transcription or translation, of course, there are. Um, it just, for the purpose of the example, so why reactions happen slow? What prevents them from going slow? Um, this chair, 
Does it have energy? That's physics question. Does it have energy? Physical energy. Yeah. Yeah, it does. How can I release this energy? I can throw it out of the window. By the time it reaches the ground, it, it's going to have a good deal of kinetic energy, okay? So I convert potential energy into kinetic energy, okay? It has a potential, right? But in order to get this energy, I really have to haul it all the way to the window, break the window and throw it out, right? So I have to go through some kind of a barrier. With chemical reactions, it's the same way. Chemical reactions have what is called the activation energy. This green peak on the graph in the upper right corner of the slide. It's sort of a bump that reactants have to go over to be converted into products. Does that make sense? That's called activation energy. Great example of high activation energy of the reaction is very simple reaction between no, hydrogen and oxygen. What this reaction is going to produce, if you mix hydrogen and oxygen, what should what should you get in the end? Water. Imagine for a second that you have a tank of hydrogen and a tank of oxygen, and you have some sort of a bell, and you mix them under this bell. What's going to happen when you mix them? Nothing. You can wait for like a thousand years. Nothing. Because they're not going to react with each other. They cannot get over that hump, the activation energy hump. How can you get them over? Apply energy to the reactants. Essentially, you can take a match, stick it under the bell. Hydrogen and oxygen will react. Oh my God, they will explode actually. And if you survive the explosion, you will see a lot of water droplets. Okay? So same goes for the enzymes. The reason chemical reactions in the cell go slowly, they cannot get over that hump, the hump of activation energy. What enzymes do is they lower the activation energy. Right? You can see the sort of energy profile of the reaction on this graph, uh, it's, it's shown in red, okay, with the lowered activation energy. Now think about this. Enzymes, will they change the outcome of the reaction? If, will they? No, not really, right? It's still going to be the same reactants, it's going to be the same products, but the conversion will be much faster. So the enzymes, they increase the rate of the reaction, but they do not affect the ratio of products. Okay? Does that make sense? They change rate, not the ratio. And as any facilitators, they aren't spent or wasted in the reaction. In the story of Cinderella, which I barely remember, in the beginning, the stepmother, evil stepmother, since she doesn't want Cinderella to go to the to the ball, maybe it's not the right rendition. Look, that's what I was told when I was a kid. Uh, and she gave Cinderella some ridiculous tasks. Something like she mixes like rice and some other grain and tells her to separate them. Okay, something like that. Can you do that manually, technically? Can you? Yes. How long would it take you? A lot. So, a little mi mice, I think it was mice, they, they 
they come to help her, and they quickly separate it. Mice aren't dying during this process. They aren't killed or anything, okay? they enzymes. They come, help, leave. The process goes faster. Enzyme is not wasted. Does that make sense? That's very important. Enzyme is not chemically modified. It's not changed. Okay? It gets into the reaction. Look at this. It gets into the reaction. It comes out of the reaction. Enzyme is still the same. It can do another round. Does that make sense? Okay. Enzymes are very, very specific. Extremely specific. They will facilitate only their reaction. Again, if we go back to the enzymes that break down disaccharides, that like uh, uh, the sucrase, okay, or lactase. Sucrose and lactose, if you look at the structures, they're pretty similar, but it turns out that sucrose will be broken, its breakdown will be facilitated by sucrase only. And lactose hydrolysis will be facilitated by lactase only. So enzymes are very specific. Okay. And they work at the optimal conditions. But what it means, the optimal. Say you want to build a graph with a hypothetical enzyme activity. You see that black graph right here? Okay. Now, let's say... This is pH, and this is enzyme activity. And say this is the ideal pH, whatever it is. Right? What would the activity graph look like? Would it look like this? Or it would look more like this? The dotted line or the solid line? What do you think? I try to make this dotted line thing as narrow as possible. What do you think? pH is optimal. If optimal pH for the enzyme is 7, is it going to work at 6.5? It will, but... It's not going to... Six? Probably so. Five and a half? Maybe. So, the point is, when we say that optimal pH for the enzyme is, say, seven, it doesn't mean that if we diverge from seven just a little, enzyme activity will cease completely. Okay? Huh? It's going to be... Yeah, it's going to be like a solid line on this, on this graph. Does that make sense? Some enzymes have very narrow range of activity. Okay, they would work. You div if we say seven, you want it to be no less than six and a half and no more than seven and a half. Others would work starting from two and ending at fourteen. Okay, in terms of pH. Same goes for the temperature. Some enzymes will be quickly inactivated at I don't know. 42 Celsius, some would work fine from 15 Celsius to 60, okay? So, range is different, but generally, if you think about this, you diverge from the optimal condition, enzyme would still work, but with less efficiency. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so understand the concepts guarding the enzyme. The concepts of specificity, optimal conditions, changing rate but not ratio, and the fact that enzyme is not modified during chemical reaction. Right? Now, applying this to microbes, where are the enzymes? Enzymes can be inside of the cell. They're called endoenzymes. What do you think these enzymes control? Which processes these enzymes facilitate that are inside of the cell? Any 
Any examples? What they could do? Good. Metabolic processes. Like what? Good. So, for instance, um, getting energy, breaking down you know, glucose or lactose. Okay. Would, can they control protein synthesis? Sure. Why not? Anything that happens inside of the cell is facilitated by endoenzymes. Does that make sense? Can they be a virulence factor? Endoenzymes. Can they serve as the virulence factor? Giving you fair warning, it's if you say yes or no, I will ask you to explain why you said so. Don't worry if you get it wrong. Can they be virulence factors? Enzymes inside of the bacterial cell, for instance. For instance. Yes. How? I would say because they can affect factors such as like how how fast the bacteria or the cell or the virus, or whatever, happens to be like replicates, or um, how efficient it does use energy, so it can maybe change its internal chemistry somehow to better adapt it to the environment, thus increasing its survivability. Good. Very good, exactly. If certain endoenzyme increases the survival, as Jason said, of the microbe in a certain environment, sure, why not? Does that make sense? Endoenzymes can make capsule, for instance. Endoenzymes may, may break down antibiotics that enter the bacterial cell and confer resistance. Plenty of options, right? What about exoenzymes? What do they do? Look at the picture. Where are the substrates for exoenzymes? Outside of the cell. What can be a substrate outside of the bacterial cell? What can serve as a substrate? If you have fungi that grow on a dead tree, it can be a substrate. Yeah, 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 something is in that tree like lignin or cellulose, right? They break down lignin and cellulose. Now, Fungi on the tree, that tree is a pretty fascinating, but we focus most on the clinically important microbes. Where do clinically important microbes grow? When do we, when do we start caring about them? If you have clinically important microbe sitting on the floor, or better say, if you have clinically important microbes sitting on the floor in the building five kilometers from here, do you really care about it right now? When do we, huh? When do we start to care about them? When do we start to care about them? When we, say again? When we get sick. So microbes get where? Into the, into the what? The body, the patient, right? So microbes start to grow in the body. Does that make sense? And these microbes say they produce exoenzymes. What's going to be the substrate for the exoenzymes in the human body? Human cells, tissues, right? Does that make sense? Does it? I'll give you an example. So exoenzymes, can they be virulence factors? Well, hell yes. Have you heard of trying to think about some really nice disease? Well, let's say necrotizing fasciitis. If I'm going to do it, make it scary, then let's do it as scary as possible. Have you heard about necrotizing fasciitis? Have you seen pictures of it? Do you want to see the pictures of it? No? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, it's what some th sometimes is referred to as flesh-eating bacteria. It's not just one bacteria. It can be Staphylococcus aureus. It can be, in rare cases, Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, it can be Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Staph aureus, the infamous microbe, produces a bunch of exoenzymes, which means they are released from the cell. Let's say Staph aureus is in the human tissues. So these enzymes end up in the human tissues. Some of them, for instance, one of the enzymes that can be produced by Staph aureus is called collagenase. What do you think it does? Breaks down collagen. Where are you going to find collagen? One of four types of tissues. Everywhere, but it's it's a main protein component of what tissue? Skin is not a tissue; it's an organ. It's not four types of tissues. People connective. There you go. It's a major protein component of connective tissue. What does connective tissue do? It connect. Yes, it holds everything together. So when you break down connective tissue, things just start to fall apart. And if you look at the lesion, well, I wouldn't say lesions. <laughs> if you would look at the photographs of the patients with the necrotizing fasciitis, their tissues quite literally fall apart. Their flesh is just muscles, since muscle is a package in a muscle fiber is a package in the connective tissue, endomysium, pyramysium, epimysium. They're getting destroyed, muscle fibers fall apart. Everything falls apart. Does that make sense? So that, an ex that is an example of exoenzyme that serves as the virulence factor. It causes the disease. Does that make sense? So anything that, pretty much any enzyme that's produced by the microbe, clinically important bacteria, for example, most of them are going to be virulence factors. Most of them will contribute to the disease in one or another way. Does that make sense? Now, some enzymes can be produced at the constant level. They are called constitutive. Did I? Yeah. So that's the that's the word, constitutive enzymes. However, synthesis of most of the enzymes is regulated. These enzymes are called well, regulated, and they may respond, their levels may respond to amount of substrate that's available or amount of product that is made. And here I want to refer to the uh, operons. Remember we have discussed the lactose operon. Okay. So lactose rep operon, is it inducible operon or repressible? Inducible. What induces it? Lactose operon. What, which molecule induces? Lactose, yes. If lactose levels increase, expression of genes in the lactose operon goes, if it's inducible, no. Lactose levels go up, expression goes up, amount of enzymes that are produced goes up. More enzymes, they more effectively break down the lactose. Lactose levels go down, amount of enzymes goes down. Negative feedback regulation. Does so that make sense? Okay. So that's one way to regulate the amount of enzyme produced. That's regulated. And same, we talked about tryptophan operon, which is repressible regulation by a product. Okay. Now, can we regulate the enzymatic activity without changing the gene expression. 
And the answer is yes. Okay. There are various types of inhibition and stimulation, so on and so forth. First of all, some of the enzymes, they require cofactors or coenzymes. We usually refer to cofactor, so we usually cofactors are usually considered to be uh, just atoms, like metals. <coughs> Sorry. For example, proteins <clears throat> that bind the DNA have a motif. Now I need to explain what the motif is. Motif, the word is like this, motif, is a certain part of the protein that is repeated throughout the related ones. Um, like um, all cars have wheels, okay? They may be different, but they all cars, they all have wheels. All planes have wings, and so on and so forth. So proteins with a similar function will have similar motifs. There's a motif in proteins that bind DNA called zinc finger. This motif contains the metal zinc. Zinc is essential for the protein function. It's a cofactor. <clears throat> proteins that synthesize DNA DNA polymerases use magnesium as the cofactor. Okay. Um, other enzymes require organic molecule. We call them those organic molecules. We call them coenzymes. You may have seen uh, the coenzyme Q on some cosmetic products. Practically all vitamins are coenzymes. A lot of them are used in the processes like cellular respiration. Vitamin B12 is the important cofactor for the enzymes uh, responsible for the cell division. Okay, it helps. Uh, lack of vitamin B12 could, you know, leads to the problems with fast dividing cells. Does that make sense? Do you understand what cofactor and coenzyme? So it's, it's not a protein, it's something else that this protein requ requires. So the protein molecule, the enzyme without cofactor is called apoenzyme. The enzyme with the cofactor is holoenzyme. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? So like this bottle without a lead is the apoenzyme. Lead is the cofactor. And together they form holoenzyme. Does that make sense? Good. So this this is the concept that I want you to understand. Apoenzyme, cofactor, slash coenzyme, holoenzyme. How can enzyme, enzymatic activity be regulated? Can it be inhibited? Can it be activated? Yes, it can be. There are two types of inhibition. The competitive inhibition and non-competitive. Competitive inhibition is when inhibitor binds to the active site of the enzyme instead of a substrate. You can see it here this illustration in the upper left corner. Does that make sense? So inhibitor binds to the enzyme and prevents substrate from binding to it. Okay? Is that good enough? That makes sense? Okay. Non-competitive is when inhibitor binds to some other site, not the active site, and some other you know, part of the enzyme, so-called allosteric side of the enzyme, and it changes the enzyme conformation in the way that substrate cannot bind to the enzyme anymore. Does that make sense? So in non-competitive, in the competitive inhibition, in the competitive one, 
if you will progressively increase the substrate concentration, it will outcompete the inhibitor. In non-competitive, it would have no effect because they bind to different different sites. Does that make sense? So competitive is when inhibitor and substrate compete for the active site. Non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site. Does that make sense? Good. Now, <clears throat> allosteric may not only, so that's the example of allosteric inhibition or non-competitive inhibition. We, we can pretty much put the sign of equality between them. Okay. Now, allosteric may not be only inhibition, it may also be activation. You may have a molecule that binds to the allosteric site on the enzyme and makes it active, makes it work. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, all these different types of inhibitions and activation, special inhibitions, how they can regulate the activity of the enzymes in the certain metabolic pathways. Let's take a glance on this one at the bottom. Most enzymes do not work by themselves. They are linked in, in the branching pathways. Um, think about glycolysis. You have a number of chemical reactions. First reaction produces a product, say, glucose is phosphorylated glucose 6-phosphate. Okay. Glucose 6-phosphate is then isomerizing the fructose 6-phosphate, which then is additionally phosphorylated fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Uh, so the product of the first reaction serves as the substrate for the next. Does that make sense? The product is used as a substrate for the next reaction. That's the linear pathway. Krebs cycle that we're going to talk about is the cyclic pathway. There are plenty. Pathways can diverge, they can converge in different ways. Now, the products in those pathways often regulate the pathway activity by itself. For instance, you have the enzyme that breaks down a certain substrate. Okay, It converts substrate into the intermediate substrate A, which is converted into the intermediate substrate B, which produces some sort of an end product. As end product accumulates, it may serve as the allosteric inhibitor to the initial enzyme. Does that make sense? Again, you've got a positive, oh sorry, we got, you've got a negative feedback loop here. Okay, as the concentration of the final product decreases, then the, the pathway becomes active again. Got it? So understand the competitive versus non-competitive inhibition. What is allosteric? Okay, activation and, and inhibition. And understand the negative feedback regulation of the enzymes by the product that they make. So now we start talking about the energy producing processes in the cell. We call it, we're going to start with aerobic respiration. We're going to focus on it the most. I bet you're all pretty familiar with that. I will tell you what I'm going to ask you about on the exam. So glycolysis is the process that can be found in practically all organisms. Okay? It's the first step in an attempt to oxidize a glucose molecule. Okay? You can see that glucose molecule. Its main products ATP, pyruvate, and electron carriers. But remember we talked about the energy flow in the cell. What constitutes 
the energy in the cell? Which elementary particles constitute the energy in the cell? That's molecule. It helps to conserve the energy that is transferred in redox reactions, extracted from the redox reactions. Which particles are exchanged between molecules and the redox reactions? Electrons. So glycolysis is the first step. Sometimes it's the only step in the process of extracting energy from those electrons. Does that make sense? Okay. The glucose, again, it's an attempt to oxidize glucose. Not very successful, honestly. Okay. Um, glycolysis always happens in the cytoplasm. It doesn't require a, spe uh, a specific organelle or a specific location. Okay, it doesn't, it's not membrane-bound process, right? And uh, we start with a six-carbon molecule of glucose. And I want you to keep in mind those six carbons, okay? And glucose first gets phosphorylated, producing fructose diphosphate in several steps. So first, to phosphorylate, to add phosphate residue to glucose, you need to use ATP. So you invest energy. Does that make sense? So that's the first step, energy investment. And then fructose diphosphate is broken down into two intermediates, glyceraldehyde three phosphate molecules. Okay, these molecules are not very stable, they high energy molecules, and they are further oxidized. And the electrons are taken away from them, can okay, carry it out, carry it away by the molecules of NADH. So NAD, the oxidized form, okay, it oxidizes glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate becoming NADH, so that's going to be oxidized form, and this is reduced form, okay, and you've got NADH. Also in the process of oxidation of each glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, two molecules of ATP is produced, okay, and you've got a molecule of pyruvate. Does that make sense? In fact, this phosphate is transferred to the molecule of ADP. Okay, so there's a there's an intermediate called phosphonyl pyruvate, which contains phosphate. This phosphate is transferred to ADP molecule, forming ATP. This is called substrate level phosphorylation. So let's take a look at the products. How many NADH molecules are produced in the glycolysis? How many NADH? It's there, two. How many pyruvate molecules? Two. How many ATP molecules? Two. Why two? Because you make four, but you have to invest two in the beginning. Does that make sense? Right? So you make two here and two here. So you make a total of four, but you've got to invest two in the beginning. Does that make sense? So you have two pyruvates, two NADH, and two ATP molecules. Two ATP, is that a lot? No. So that's kind of a lousy way to make ATP. Okay? Uh, what's the, so from the standpoint of further processes, what is the, what are the couple of great things that are produced? NADH. Why? What's the purpose of NADH? What does it carry? 
electrons. It carries electrons, high energy electrons. Okay, so we've got we've got ourselves a couple of high energy electrons, actually four of them. And where does pyruvate go? Anyone? Huh? Later. Next step. Anyone remembers? Where does it go? After the glycolysis. It'll go into the Krebs cycle. And we'll talk about it. So ATP out for organisms, for aerobic organisms, aerobic bacteria, like, for example, Staphylococcus epidermidis, okay? ATP yield of glycolysis is not that important. It's important that pyruvate is ready to enter the uh, Krebs cycle. Any carbon dioxide produced, I'm asking you. No. That's important. So if you would look at the color of those carbons, so if six carbons in initial glucose molecules, at the end of glycolysis, those six carbons are still in place. Does that make sense? You didn't lose any carbons yet. Carbons are still there. Does that make sense? So then, pyruvate is channeled into the Krebs cycle. However, three carbons in one molecule is a little bit too much. So in the first step of the um, so-called transition stage, it's not in the picture. In the transition stage, you have three carbon pyruvate. Which is converted to two carbon acetyl CoA. You can see the acetyl CoA right here on the skin. See that? In the upper right con corner. That's acetyl CoA. It's acetyl CoA. So if two carbons attached to the uh, coenzyme, when you go from three carbons to two carbons, you're losing something. What? A carbon? Come on, speak up. You're losing a carbon. In which form do you lose a carbon? Where does it go, this carbon? What happens to it? Huh? Well, microbes breathe it out too in the form of what? Carbon dioxide. Great. Carbon dioxide. So we lost carbon number one. Okay? And then this two carbon intermediate enters the Krebs cycle where it combines with a four carbon molecule of oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetic acid. Two plus four. Six. Forms the citrate. Now citrate is converted into the alpha ketoglutrate eventually with five carbons. Six minus five, you lose a carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. Another carbon's lost. Alpha ketoglutarate is converted into the succinyl CoA with four carbons. What is lost again? Another carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. How many carbon dioxides have we lost up to date? Hmm? We lost during transition. We lost in the conversion of citrate to alpha ketoglutrate and then the conversion to succinyl CoA. How many? Three. How many carbons entered the transition stage? Three. So we oxidized the entire pyruvate molecule. Does that make sense? Every carbon in the pyruvate molecule has been oxidized to CO2. 
many pyruvate molecules were produced in the glycolysis? Two. How many Krebs cycles happen per one glucose molecule? Two. One glucose molecule is broken into two pyruvates. Each pyruvate enters its Krebs cycle. Does that make sense? So, if each Krebs cycle, including transition state, oxidizes three carbons, how many carbons are going to be oxidized in two Krebs cycles? Six. That's the glucose chemical formula. We oxidize it, we get 6 CO2, right? Does that make sense? In the bottom right corner, I write the equation. And we get water. We'll get to the point of water. We'll discuss <clears throat> how it happens, what, what's going on with water. It doesn't make sense to you. The whole purpose of Krebs cycle, transition state in the cycle itself, is to oxidize the carbons, the glucose. Does that make sense? We got it? When we oxidize the carbons, what do we take away from the carbons? We oxidize them. Hmm? We oxidize the carbons. We take away. See again? Electrons. Very good. Where do these electrons go? What accepts electrons immediately? Electron carriers. Very good. Let's take a glance. There is one NADH that's produced during transition stage, right? There is NADH that's produced when isocitrate is converted to alpha ketoglutrate. NADH that's produced during the conversion of alpha ketoglutrate to 6 enyl coa Okay, so far we've got one, two, three. <clears throat> what happens next? You have four carbon molecules, succinyl CoA, that undergoes several steps of oxidation that doesn't involve carbons. It's hydrogens that are being oxidized. Does that make sense? You still can take electrons from the molecule. It, it just doesn't lose carbons. When you keep doing that, you produce FADH2. That's another reduced form of the electron carrier. And at the last step, when you convert malate to oxaloacetic acid, produce fourth NADH. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So in the cycle itself, you produce one, two, three molecules of NADH, plus you have one from transition step, plus you have FADH2, plus you have one molecule of ATP, the substrate level of substrate level phosphorylation. So per one cycle, four and ADH, well, including transition stage, four and ADH, one FADH2, one ATP. How many Krebs cycles, quote unquote, are ran per one glucose molecules? Two. So for two cycles. How many NAD, including transition step, how many NADH then? For two cycles. Eight NADH. How many FADH2? Two. 
how many ATPs? Two. How many CO2s? Six. Well, CO2 is not that interesting. Forget it. What's the main outcome? What is the what is the catch? What is the most important yield of Krebs cycle? Huh? Come on, it's two. It's just nothing. What? Think about what other molecules are produced. Say it. Say it out loud. N, NADH. Good. And F, FADH2. What? What are they? What? What is? What are their functions? Excellent. So they are electron carriers. What is the main, like, big time outcome if they are electron carriers? What do they carry? In the form of electrons. So high energy electrons. That's the that's the that's the most important yield. Does that make sense? So look, how many ATPs so far were made during glycolysis? Two. How many ATPs in Krebs cycle? Two. Per, per one molecule of glucose. It's lousy. Really. The ATP yield so far is lousy. But we've got a load of high energy electrons. Does that make sense? That's really important. It's like very, very important. Another important um, function of the Krebs cycle is that the molecules that constitute the cycle can be used in the cellular metabolism to synthesize something else. For instance, Citric acid can be used to make fatty acids and sterols. So it can be used as the intermediate to produce lipids. Alpha ketoglutrate can be used to produce both nucleotides and amino acids. Succinyl CoA serves as the intermediate for the porphyrin production. In humans, it's going to be heme. In plants, it's going to be chlorophyll. Oxaloacetic acid can also serve as the intermediate for the amino acid and nucleotide synthesis. Before we move on to wrap up, what do you have to understand about glycolysis, about Krebs cycle? Actually, we're going to... Uh, wrap it up and we're going to take a break, right? What you have to understand about the Krebs cycle. First, the outcome, including transition step. How many Krebs cycles happen per one molecule of glucose? What is the main product? Main, I mean, the important outcome. It's not definitely not ATP because it's just too little. It's electrons, okay? And what happens to the carbons of that initial glucose? Does that make sense? That Krebs cycle oxidizes the carbons of the glucose in order to get high energy electrons and load them on the electron carriers. And when we combine glycolysis and Krebs cycle, we end up with very few ATP, but a lot of high energy electrons loaded on NADH and FADH2. Okay? After the break, we're going to pull out the microscopes, we're going to do some microscopy, and try some. I don't know if we're going to find anything in that tank, but we will try. We'll try some bacterial samples, you know. But so far, take a break and 
we'll review the quiz as well.